Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm at a uh, water-filled quarry in Quebec, and um, I'll just uh, do a quick uh, scan of it here for you so you can see, get sort of the lay of the land. So over here, there's a um, bunch of people scuba diving, including my 16-year-old uh, son, Neil. Okay, he's doing his uh, open water dive. So that's why we're here. So it's this pretty big quarry. And what's really interesting is, now the sun might interfere a bit here. I'll try to block the sun so you can get a better view. Here we go, you can see the contrast. So there's a big crane up at the top, which they use for uh, bungee jumping. And you can see all of this uh, exposed rock. So less than a week ago, there was a uh, rock slide here. The whole face of the cliff uh, gave way, went tumbling down into the, uh, into the lake there, and it created a uh, tsunami. And the tsunami moved across the uh, lake over here to the uh, little buildings and docks where the divers go and people swim in the summer. And it caused some damage here to this uh, structure right behind those people. Broke some slats and stuff. And it washed up onto the uh, beach. And what it did is it brought loads of sand and uh, stuff from the bottom and it washed it up into the buildings and uh, into the structures and over on the shoreline there. And uh, I don't know the height of this tsunami, but over on this side, um, somewhere roughly, I think it's over here, it's difficult to see. If you're walking along that shoreline, you can see it. There, there's a, they put stuff on the bottom for the divers to see. So there's an old plane an old uh, old aircraft that's uh, sitting on the bottom, propeller-driven plane, it's in about 25 feet of water. So that water surge from this uh, rock fall came across, and apparently it moved the plane about two feet or so closer to the uh, to the uh, where the divers are over there. So it just, and that's in 25 feet of water. So you can imagine the force being transmitted you know, right through to the bottom of this uh, lake. I'll try to get some more details and post some links if I can find some stories on uh, on this tsunami. But, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty fascinating. And, uh, you know, if I block the sun here, you can get some better views of, you know, look at the, like, so you can see the dark area is uh, the cliff face normal and the, the white area the light area, you can see it's sort of a sharp division, is where the whole uh, rock face there came tumbling down. So it's fascinating. But one of the things I wanted to talk about in the quarry, well, a little bit of uh, geology for you. I mean, there's all kinds of interesting rocks here. There's some yellowish, uh, I'm not a geologist, right? But there's, there, there's yellowish type rocks here. Very interesting, uh, probably means there's uh, sulfur in them, or uh, it might be olivine, which is a greenish type rock, which is uh, one of the rocks that is best for capturing carbon dioxide. If you grind it up to increase the surface area, you get um, natural weathering from this rock, and if we can accelerate the rate of weathering, that would capture CO2. Down here, there's uh, some reddish, uh, type rocks. Uh, that's pro the red is a good indication that there's iron. And last video I talked about iron salt aerosols as a method for um, actually doing a lot of things, namely um, acting as cloud condensation nuclei um, to uh, form marine clouds over the water. Uh, also to break down things like uh, nitrous oxide and methane, and also to fall into the ocean and uh, fertilize the ocean with iron, which is a limiting micronutrient in the ocean, um, and that can stimulate phytoplankton blooms, which can then suck CO2 out of the 
atmosphere. And also in my last video, I talked about, you know, think of all this rock. I mean, why, why is this rock being quarried? And I, I think it's just, um, I think it's essentially just for aggregate, for concrete. So concrete, about 80% of concrete is just rocks. Basically small rocks um, and they form the substance of concrete. About 10% of the of the uh, concrete is sand. Okay, you, you don't want, uh, obviously when the when you're pouring the concrete and if you just have big aggregate um, there's going to be a lot of air gaps and stuff between the, the big rock. Maybe the, the uh, cement won't get in, which is the third component. So, so there's sand. About 10% of the concrete mix is sand. And the last 10% is the glue, if you like. It's the, it's the cement. You know, you might hear, you've probably heard the term Portland cement. Basically, the, the, the cement is uh, limestone. Calcium carbonate. Okay, the carbonate is uh, basically, so the idea is like in uh, the ocean, clams, for example, that creature, critter, it uh, takes CO2 out of the water, takes calcium out of the water, combines them into calcium carbonate, which forms the hard shell of the clam. And uh, basically, we want to do this with CO2 from the atmosphere. So if we can take CO2 from the atmosphere or the ocean and uh, combine it with calcium, react it with calcium, we can produce limestone artificially. So one of the ideas that seems like it could be very scalable is um, I, I mentioned this company Blue Planet, which has some pilot uh, projects to actually do this very thing, to take the CO2 that's uh, captured from the air and to react it with calcium and to produce calcium carbonate or limestone and then that limestone will be, that limestone, as I said, it makes up 10% of the component of, of uh, concrete. So rather than mining the limestone, right, you can see obviously you know, the globe, globally, we do huge amounts of mining for this aggregate. And you can see over here on the other side, just some of the scale of this. Like, uh, look across the road there, and you can see the, um, you know, it looks like they've actually cut away into the rock there for the road. But in the foreground, there's all of these piles of rock from the mining operation. So globally, there's huge... Uh, huge quantities of aggregate that is mined, sand, we need sand, and the world is actually running out of sand, believe it or not. You know, the, the scale of these things is enormous. Think of all the concrete that's poured around the world. And the 10%, of course, is the limestone. So if we can, so there's pilot projects, like I say, from Blue Planet to produce limestone by captured CO2 from the air. So if we could do this on a very, very large scale, we could extract huge amounts of uh, CO2 from the atmosphere. So this all fits under the umbrella of uh, carbon dioxide removal. Okay, um, and uh, there's a number of different startup companies that are looking at, normally in the normal process of making concrete now and pouring concrete there's a lot of carbon dioxide released okay there's a lot of, of co2 that's released in the process so so there's companies like carbon capture carbon cure um, there's a bunch of other ones and they're looking at um, trying to improve the process of, uh, of, of pouring concrete Make, you know, and then it's curing. It's a chemical reaction when it cures and hardens and to have that process not produce CO2 but actually to even, you know, be, CO, be neutral in terms of uh, carbon production or even capture carbon. Um, you know, as good as our technology is in the world these days, concrete is crap. 
right? I mean, they they pour concrete on a bridge or something, and you know, it's lasting like a couple decades, and then there's major repairs needed on on infrastructure, especially in Quebec. You know, it's notorious for concrete falling from bridges and things like that. So, you know, concrete, if we can, like, so basically, we can do a lot better. The Romans, they uh, built concrete structures that are still there 2,000 years later. And especially, uh, you know, wharfs and things and structures in the ocean. And uh, apparently they used um, salt water in their process of, of pouring the concrete. And they had this formula for doing it that is kind of lost through the ages of time. And we don't know how to do it, but we know their concrete structures last thousands of years. I mean, if we could, you know, so our, our couple decades is pathetic, you know, for roads and bridges and structures. And if we could uh, figure out how to make it last even a hundred years, you know, instead of 30 years, three times longer, right, then we wouldn't have to, uh, you know, that would reduce um, the the uh, quantities of concrete poured each year. A lot, of, a lot of the stuff that's poured is just in maintaining structures that are falling apart because of the... Uh, poor quality of the of the the concrete so so there's companies that are looking at that but I think the most interesting is the is blue planet so check them out google it and have a look at the uh, process so um, anyway it's a beautiful day for my little hike up and around the quarry and uh, like I said this is the uh, this is the coolest thing um you know and i think i did a video a couple of years ago of a landslide which came down and blocked the river but you know i wouldn't want to be uh scuba diving i do have my certification you know i kind of blew it i should have gone diving with my son today but you know it's a bit cold water's a bit cold i think it's about 10 degrees celsius the water but you know i wouldn't want to be in the water when this tsunami uh, came through it'd probably be okay but even if you're 25 feet down you know it pushed it pushed a structure something on the bottom a couple feet and apparently at 60 feet down there's a there's a submarine i mean they they sink stuff in here i think for the uh divers okay so anyway i'm having a lot of fun out here so this video is just kind of a you know, I just wanted to share uh, some of this neat stuff with you. So um, thank you for listening. And, uh, you know, please always put in your uh, suggestions um, in the comment section of the videos. Um, I do read all of the comments. I'm not able to respond, obviously, when there's lots of them to everyone. Um, but, you know, I do read them all and I try to, you know, add some information when I get time but you know time's always always the issue and uh, remember to check out my website paulbeckwith.net and uh, I try to post a couple videos a week and uh, you know I basically look at all of the climate system you know everything is happening much faster than normal um, you know we've just had these these massive uh, fires like basically a place called ironically called paradise was just basically wiped from the face of the earth by um, a wildfire in the last few days um, this fire you know this this California has Santa Ana winds they've always had these Santa Ana winds uh, <coughs> which is uh, you know the cold air from up high in the Sierra Nevada it descends it warms up it um, the, the, it, the, the, the motion of the air gets um, accelerated through the valleys and stuff and you can build up to quite high speeds you know 60 miles an hour 70 miles an hour and um, you know it's they're in a drought there massive drought so sparks or you know, even the high winds can knock over power lines. I think that's happening a lot, and then these power lines cause a fire, and then the fire spreads like crazy. So Paradise, 27,000 people um, in this town, they had to bail and drive along roads uh, between, you know, to, to escape the fire on both sides of the road. You know, and many people died, and over like almost 7,000 structures.